wild dogs. In India, we call them dol. In an ancient Indian language, it means reckless and daring. Strategy, teamwork, speed. These pack hunters are one of the most efficient killing machines in the Indian forest. The tiger and leopard have their place, but for me, the dole reign is the supreme hunters. I've been on their trail for more than five years, and this is my story. I am Krupaka. I've been filming in the forests of the Niligiri Mountains for over 15 years. I like to think of them as my own backyard, all 5,000 square kilometers. I've filmed the intimate lives of most animals here, but the one I would like to film most always eludes me. They are indeed the phantoms of our forest. Although I've been following the doll for the past five years, I never had much success. On a good day, I could find the dogs. On a very good day, I could film them at a distance. But I could never get close. I was failing and desperate. But one man was about to enter my life and change everything. One of the local tribes here is called Kadu Karuba. Although they've always been forest dwellers, their traditional skills now reside with just a few. I'd heard their leader was one of the best trackers in the Niligiris. His name was Bomber. He was a tiny fellow of about four and a half feet. It seemed strange to ask for help from the very people who once helped to hunt the doll for bounty. And they must have thought so too. But I felt I had nothing to lose because this man was my last hope. With Bomber by my side, I begin to see the forest with new eyes. He makes it seem so simple, this man. The dogs have gone this way, sir. Bomber, how do you know it's not that way? They didn't go that way, sir. The dew is still on the grass. See? This day began like any other. We'd been tracking for around two hours. And then, alarm calls from the ever-watchful Langos. A pack of dolls have treed a leopard. Although thrice the size of a doll, the big cat knows it wouldn't stand a chance on the ground. The doll's sheer audacity and courage, as usual, impresses me. Dogs take up watch for an hour or so, and then lose interest. But the leopard doesn't move until long after the doll have gone. 
When the coast is clear, he descends with as much dignity as he can muster. In just a few months, Bomber and I have come a long way. We're able to track down the doll more often. And I'm learning new skills from him every day. We've been following one particular doll pack. And they're beginning to tolerate our presence. Phantoms have become individuals. We're now familiar with every member of the pack. It comprises six pups and four adults. This is the alpha male. He's six years old. At times he can seem a little cranky, but it's all bluff. That's the alpha male's first lieutenant. Five years old, he carries a no-nonsense air about him. That young fellow is the third male. At two years old, he's just a teenager. But for the pups, he's a mentor. Their favorite uncle. And there's the alpha female. More than a mother, she's the heart and soul of the pack. She commands the respect of all pack members, often leading them on hunts, unusual among the doll. Bomber too admires her, and has named her Kamadi, after his favourite niece. Although we didn't know just yet, Kamadi would soon have a deep impact upon our lives. It's late morning, and the dogs take their siesta. The doll disliked the heat of the sun intensely, and whenever possible, they keep to the shade. It's crucial to conserve energy for their high-speed hunts. Something's wrong. Kamadi is clearly tense. An enemy is on the prowl nearby. The wild dogs are anxious, especially Kamadi, the alpha female. There must be a predator close by. Her instinct tells her, move. With six defenseless pups, she's taking no chances. The dog's actions have alerted us to the presence of a tiger nearby. And Kamadi is not the only one who knows. The elephants too have young to protect. It's not unknown for tigers to kill elephant calves. With the tiger circling, the herd is clearly nervous. They move away, only to blunder into the doll.
I'm amazed. I know all too well what it's like to be chased by an elephant. But still, the doll is so carefree. After the pups have had their bit of fun, the dogs move off. With our doll's territory ranging over 80 square kilometers, it's been incredibly difficult to follow the pack. That's why it's so important for us to be accepted by Kamadi and the alpha male. When we do locate them, I feel honored they now allow us to sit and watch them for hours. In the Indian forest, it's rare that wild animals tolerate the presence of humans. All wild animals have good reason to be wary of man, but more so the doll. During the British rule in India, doll were branded as vermin. The doll was seen as little better than rabid dogs, decimating the game animals the British wanted to kill. The doll was slaughtered mercilessly. In fact, they carried a bounty on their head until late into the 20th century. The fact that the doll had evolved over millions of years in these forests meant nothing. Eventually, it was understood they had it all wrong and the doll were released from their death sentence just prior to extinction. Today, they are protected by law and thriving. It's May. The pre-monsoon has brought the first showers. The days are hot and sultry. But beneath the canopy, the forest is greening after the long dry season. The youngsters are now six months old. The growing pups are always hungry and they're demanding food again. They communicate this to the adults by begging. It's instinctive. When they were just puppies, the elders would simply regurgitate the meat fresh from a kill. Now they're too old for that and their begging is a none too gentle hint for the adults to get onto the hunt. After some time, the adults know they can't put it off any longer. Kamadi makes the decision and the pack sets off. The other large predators in these forests lie in wait for their prey, but the doll go looking for theirs. The dog's teamwork and their hunting strategies are crucial to their success. Several kilometers later, they target their victim. This time it's their favorite game, chittel or spotted deer. dogs give chase, the forest comes alive. The dogs literally run their victim to exhaustion through a high-speed chase. Us too. It's happening close by. They've cornered a stag. The desperate gasping of the stag directs us, but the battle itself is obscure. Yeah! 
There's Kamadi. Blood in her mouth. That's it. The kill is over. Kamadi hears the first lieutenant calling to the pups who are waiting in the wings. Known as the whistling hunters, the doll cannot bark the way dogs do. The pup's uncle, who has been guarding them, also hears the call and brings the pups to the kill. The adults let the pups eat first. They keep watch. It's important to finish the meal swiftly. That tiger may not be far. Older dogs help the pups by ripping open the carcass for them. An adult male can eat four kilos of meat at one sitting that's a quarter of its body weight. If they have to, they can go another three days before needing to kill again. Only when the pups have had their fill do the adults help themselves. I am touched. There is so much emotion in the world of predators. After the high-speed chase, the hunters are exhausted. And having to eat so quickly, they've had little chance to catch their breath. It's been an action-packed morning, and as always, the doll take a dip in a nearby pool after the meal. In this tropical heat, it's the ultimate luxury. Kamadi seems to have been seriously injured during the hunt. Her back's been opened up by a stag's antler. The whole pack is concerned, and so are we. Hunting injuries are one of the major causes of death. If Kamadi dies, the pack could fall apart. The pack instinctively knows this and take turns to keep the wound clean. Such strong bonds in these social animals never cease to amaze me. We hope she recovers fast. The pups are seven months old. They're eager to participate in the hunt. Even their play seems to be part of their training. But Kamadi's injury doesn't prevent her from continuing the pup's hunting tuition. Today, the lesson is how to approach large prey. In this case, a gore, one of the largest wild cattle species on Earth. Being pack hunters, synchronization has to be taught at an early age. The dolls surround the victim, charging and striking from different angles at different times. The aim is to confuse and panic the prey, creating an opportunity to attack the animal's vulnerable parts. The prey's only defense is horns and hooves, both of which can inflict lethal injuries. The doll are trying to separate the calf from its mother. Later in the day, when the pack embarks on a serious hunt, the pup's enthusiasm throws the whole show into chaos. At 
At least this young pup learns one valuable lesson. When in doubt, do nothing. After all these years, I still relish every inch of the forest. There is suspense in every day, especially when we're on the trail of our doll pack. It was the alarm call of the Samba deer that first caught our attention. The Sambar had obviously spotted Kamadi's pack first and retreated to the safety of the pond. It's a stroke of luck. We find ourselves in the right place at the right time. I've got a feeling I'm about to film my first kill. It begins as a standoff. and develops into a test of nerves. If the sandbar can manage to stand their ground in knee-deep water, they'll most likely keep the dogs at bay. But the dogs continue to harass the sandbar. They're hoping to separate a nervous animal and push it into deeper water. Now, it's a waiting game. And the game pays off. Kamadi dives in. A panic-stricken fawn has broken away. going on. Kamadi has given up. And so is the rest of the pack. What's happening? They're leaving. I asked Boma why the dog suddenly left, and his answer shocks me. He explains that his people often follow the dogs when they're hunting and take their kill. He tells me they've done that for ages. And naturally, the dogs learned that if they saw humans, there was no point continuing. They just abandoned the hunt. Bomber then even admits to me that the dogs will never make a kill in front of us. And then I remember something. and I begin to understand. Those times I saw Bomber's people in the forest, running. They were following the doll and taking the kill. Apparently, it's always been that way. So the doll, if they see humans, abandon the hunt, like they did just now. I was devastated. Would I ever get to film a kill? A week went by before Bomber returned. He told me he'd felt so bad for me, he'd actually convinced his people to stop their habit of taking the wild dog's kill. It would make little difference in the short term, but anyway, it was impossible to remain angry with a man like Bomber. I was very happy we'd patched things up, just in time for us to celebrate the arrival of the monsoon.
By the end of the monsoon, the wound of the alpha female, Kamadi, is nearly healed. It's a huge relief for Bomber and I. But September is also a crucial month for the doll, and this brings new problems for Kamadi. This is a time of turmoil for the doll, because this is the beginning of the breeding season. It becomes evident that we're not the only ones following the pack. Two strangers, both young adult females, have strayed into Kamadi's territory. The doll have an unusual breeding pattern. The alpha male and female stop the younger adults from breeding, ensuring that all efforts go only towards raising the dominant pair's pups. So, these two females have split away from their pack to establish their own. But they need bachelors, and they've picked up the scent of Kamadi's pack. Kamadi is having none of it. The eligible bachelors in her pack are also its most efficient hunters. With six pups to feed, Kamadi can't afford to lose these breadwinners. The females persist. They have also realized there are two eligible bachelors in Kamadi's pack. The first lieutenant and the pup's uncle. They have strayed tantalizingly close to the pack today. I hold my breath as Kamadi approaches them. She looks determined. Their sounds are so strange. I've never heard anything like this before. I wonder what's happening to the females. Kamadi seems to have successfully driven them away. The pack seems all excited. But one female is not giving up. She's back. She's probably ensuring the bachelors get the message loud and clear. This complex behavior has not been documented before. I feel privileged, but also apprehensive. These twin seducers could split Kamadi's pack. September 26th. The pups have reached adolescence. Kamadi is coming into estrus. Having seen off the two females, she flirts with the first lieutenant. It's classic alpha female behavior. It's called pseudo-mating, where Kamadi won't allow penetration. but it may dissuade the adult males from leaving her pack. She also has to keep the alpha male happy. Kamadi will mate only with the alpha male. They'll couple several times over the week until she conceives. The gestation period is about 60 days. The first lieutenant and the uncle sit by. All they can do is bide their time.
Although we'd managed to get closer to the dogs than I'd ever dared hope, there was still that key element of the story that was missing, the kill. It was disappointing, and there seemed no way around it. And then, one evening, we get another chance. We're returning home after not seeing the dogs for the second day running. We hear alarm calls from the east and turn in their direction. We haven't a chance on foot. Fortunately for us, it's all happening along the track. Each member of the pack seems to have its role cut out. The first lieutenant is on the heels of the chitter. Kamadi and some pups seem to be herding them towards the nearby pond. By the time we catch up, the alpha male and the other pups have already taken up their positions around the pond. And there they are. Kamadi and the rest of the pack have driven the deer into a trap. This time we keep low. I'm not taking a chance. Fortunately, the dogs are so busy they fail to notice us, and we're rewarded with a ringside seat. Kamadi has singled out a two-year-old chicken. The pups are now old enough to join the fray. They surround the pond and block the exits. A group of sandbar hears the commotion. They become unwilling spectators. The light is fading fast. As the chittle approaches the sandbar, seeking security in numbers, they mistake it for a dog and drive it back into the pond. It was exactly what the alpha male wanted. The cheetle is trying to get to the bank, but the deep water is favoring the doll. The experience of the alpha male is shown. It terrorizes the cheetle into swallowing water. Before the final strike. And there it is. It's shocking to many, but this is what life in the forest is all about. So that one may live, another must die. The whole drama has taken around 20 minutes, but to me, it feels like seconds. While the pups tuck in, the alpha male remains apart, on guard for predators. I want to thank him. Instead, we slip quietly and happily away. Just three days later, we come across the pups crying.
Something is seriously wrong. It takes some time to work it out. Two males are missing. The inevitable has happened. The bachelors have been seduced by the two roaming females. The pups look crestfallen. They have neither played nor slept a wink today. Their uncles have left them. Kamadi too looks listless and distracted. Her efforts to keep the two lone females at bay have gone in vain. But it's nature's way of ensuring that the species disperse and survive. Early November. Great news. Kamadi is pregnant. The pack is extensively roaming and marking the borders of its large territory. This is making it difficult for us to track them. December 15th. After the highs of the past few months, the latest dilemma feels like a body blow. Kamadi and her pack have disappeared. We have not seen nor heard them for over a month. Their territory is around 80 square kilometers. We haven't a hope of searching such a larger area ourselves. Bomber though remains optimistic. He knows the doll are very secretive when denning. Kamadi must have littered by now. It's a hard slog, but we just have to keep searching. High in the hills, we come across Bomber's people laying small fires at the mouth of crevices in the rocks, hoping to smoke out porcupine. He pleads with them to stop, explaining they could stumble across the doll den and disturb them. They're not happy, but Bomber is both polite and persuasive, and they agree in the end. Just a few months ago, this kind of cooperation would have seemed inconceivable. In fact, it surprises Bomber even more than me. Now and then, we find what seems to be a clue, and then it leads nowhere. I realize just how lucky we've been until now. The pug bark of a tiger, and fresh too. Bomber has spotted something. As I approach, I'm flooded with a sense of dread. We recognize him immediately. It's one of Kamadi's pups, now a year old. The signs of a tiger attack are clear. Ah, 
Bomber believes it could have been the guard dog at Kamadi's den. The den must have been somewhere close. But where are the doll now? And will we ever see them again? The pup killed by the tiger has been a shocking discovery. It's given our search a real urgency. In desperation, Bomber comes up with an extraordinary idea that, at any other time, would seem completely mad. He assembles the men of his hamlet, and I explain our predicament. Could they take some time out and please help us with our search for the doll? Something in our faces and my little speech must have touched them. With renewed hope, we set off in all directions. Bomber told us to begin our search on the perimeter of the forest. Experience told him that, after the incident with the tiger, Kamadi wouldn't take any chances. She'd den where she knew tigers feared to roam. We are covering yet again the same ground, a few kilometers from where we found the dead pup. <laughs> Just as we're on the verge of abandoning the search for Kamadi, Bomber finds a vital clue. Doll scats. The pack must be somewhere close by. Could this be it? Their tracks lead us downhill to a bamboo grove. Bomber sees him first, a guard dog. We don't want to alarm him and we move to another vantage point. And then we see Kamadi herself. She's bringing the pups out of the den. She must be going to feed them. They look about 25 days old. There's the alpha male. He's regurgitating meat for the pups. He picks out the bones and leaves just the soft meat. The guard dog has joined them. It's the pack's responsibility to feed him even though there's a slight disagreement. <laughs> Kamadi's now grown pups, though still inexperienced and a little clumsy, seem to have accepted their new roles as babysitters and uncles. Words cannot describe what we feel at this moment. And then, an extraordinary moment. Kamadi looks straight at us. There's a flash of anxiety, but she does nothing. 
she must have recognised us. This is the ultimate prize. We've been truly accepted by a wild doll called Kamadi, and it makes our hearts swell with pride. That way, sir. The dew is still on the grass. See? This day began like any other. We'd been trekking for around two hours. And then, alarm calls from the ever watchful Langos. A pack of dolls have treed a leopard. Although thrice the size of a doll, the big cat knows it wouldn't stand a chance on the ground. The doll's sheer audacity and courage, as usual, impresses me. Dogs take up watch for an hour or so, and then lose interest. But the leopard doesn't move until long after the doll have gone. She's the heart and soul of the pack. She commands the respect of all pack members, often leading them on hunts, unusual among the doll. Bomber too admires her, and has named her Kamadi, after his favourite niece. Although we didn't know just yet, Kamadi would soon have a deep impact upon our lives. It's late morning, and the dogs take their siesta. The doll disliked the heat of the sun intensely, and whenever possible, they keep to the shade. It's crucial to conserve energy for their high-speed hunts. Something's wrong. Kamadi is clearly tense. An enemy is on the prowl nearby. The wild dogs are anxious, especially Kamadi, the alpha female. There must be a predator close by. Her instinct tells her, move. With six defenseless wild dogs. In India, we call them Dol. In an ancient Indian language, it means reckless and daring. Strategy. Teamwork. Speed. These pack hunters are one of the most efficient killing machines in the Indian forests. The tiger and leopard have their place, but for me, the doll reigns the supreme hunters. I've been on their trail for more than five years, and this is my story.
I am Krupaka. I've been filming in the forests of the Niligiri Mountains for over 15 years. I like to think of them as my own backyard, all 5,000 square kilometers. I've filmed the intimate lives of most animals here, but the one I would like to film most always eludes me. They are indeed the phantoms of our forests. Or when the coast is clear, he descends with as much dignity as he can muster. In just a few months, Bomber and I have come a long way. We're able to track down the doll more often and I'm learning new skills from him every day. We've been following one particular doll pack, and they're beginning to tolerate our presence. Phantoms have become individuals. We're now familiar with every member of the pack. It comprises six pups, and four adults. This is the alpha male. He's six years old. At times he can seem a little cranky, but it's all bluff. That's the alpha male's first lieutenant. Five years old, he carries a no-nonsense air about him. That young fellow is the third male. At two years old, he's just a teenager. But for the pups, he's a mentor, their favorite uncle. And there's the alpha female, more than a mother. Though I've been following the doll for the past five years, I never had much success. On a good day, I could find the dogs. On a very good day, I could film them at a distance but I could never get close. I was failing and desperate. But one man was about to enter my life and change everything. One of the local tribes here is called Kadu Kuruba. Although they've always been forest dwellers, their traditional skills now reside with just a few. I'd heard their leader was one of the best trackers in the Niligiris. His name was Bomber. He was a tiny fellow of about four and a half feet. It seemed strange to ask for help from the very people who once helped to hunt the doll for bounty. And they must have thought so too. But I felt I had nothing to lose because this man was my last hope. With Bomber by my side, I begin to see the forest with new eyes. He makes it seem so simple, this man. The dogs have gone this way, sir. Bomber, how do you know it's not that way? <laughs> 